The first century historian Josephus in his work entitled Wars of the Jews speaks of the cities of the plains. He tells us that in his day, evidence of what took place there could still be seen. Now this country is then so sadly burnt up that nobody cares to come at it. The country of Sodom borders upon it. It was of old a most happy land both for the fruits it bore and the riches of its cities, although it be now all burnt up. It is related how, for the impiety of its inhabitants, it was burnt by lightning, in consequence of which there are still remainders of that divine fire, and the traces or shadows of the five cities are still to be seen, as well as the ashes growing in their fruits, which fruits have a color as if they were fit to be eaten, but if you pluck them with your hands, they will dissolve into smoke and ashes. And thus, what is related of this land of Sodom hath these marks of credibility, which our very sight affords us. In 1924, the well-known archaeologist William Albright set out to find the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Accompanied by Melvin Kyle, he found pieces of brimstone at the southern end of the Dead Sea. Melvin Kyle recorded their common sense findings. A region on which brimstone was rained will show brimstone. Well, it does. We picked up pure sulfur in pieces as big as the end of my thumb. It is mixed with the marl of the mountains on the west side of the sea and now is to be found scattered along the shore of the sea even on the east side, some four or five miles distant from the ledge that contains the stratum. It has somehow scattered far and wide over this plain. History proves that mankind has a very short memory. For over 50 years, what the Albright expedition had identified was for the most part disregarded until the year 1989, when Ron Wyatt, an American explorer, once again noticed specific areas along the western shores of the Dead Sea which appeared to be ash. Could what Ron was examining actually be the remains of the biblical cities of the plains, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim? Could it be possible that the evidence had been there in plain sight for so many years? And if so, was there more to be learned? Returning home, Ron and Mary Nell began a careful study. Where should the cities be located, and what would one expect to find after thousands of years? In searching for clues, they found scripture references that mentioned four cities as forming part of the boundaries of the Canaanites. In the book of Genesis chapter 10, we're told that the borders of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, even unto Lasha, or Laish. It seems to me that it would be strange for each of those cities to be given in the biblical account as a uh, part of the border if they were each in the general location at the southern end of the Dead Sea. Uh, so it's logical that they would be at a distance from each other in a line. Ron found specific areas of ash and brimstone scattered over a distance of over 50 or more miles. One of them was located north of Jericho which was in perfect accord with 1 Samuel chapter 13, which indicates that Zeboim would be located north of the Dead Sea. Later in 1989, Ron and Mary Nell traveled back to the Dead Sea, visiting the site just below Masada. There they took samples of the whitish material which broke right off in their hands and disintegrated into particles the consistency of talcum powder. Laboratory analysis would soon confirm that what they had found was indeed ash. The first time that I went to the site just below Masada, which was the first site that I saw, um, I, I have to admit I was very overwhelmed because it just looked like a city, like uh, the shadows of a city as Josephus talked about it. But I remember that what Ron said First and foremost was, I believe this is one of the cities of the plain, but I don't know how to prove it. So at that point, he showed me how you could, you know, the ashen remains were, could just be crumbled in your hand. 
but there really wasn't much to talk about because it was, it just looked like a city that was ash. In October of 1990, Ron Wyatt and I, having just completed work on an archaeological project in Turkey, returned to the area. Early one morning we left Jerusalem and made our way toward the Dead Sea. Jerusalem sits at the top of the mountains at an elevation of approximately 2,500 feet above sea level. In contrast to the Dead Sea area, the lowest spot on earth at an elevation of some 1,378 feet below sea level. At that elevation and in somewhat of a wilderness or desert climate, it can become very hot. That day it was well over 110 degrees in the area of the cities of the plains. As we descended the mountains traveling through the wilderness of Judea, we reached the point of sea level, a vantage point still over a quarter of a mile in elevation above the surface of the Dead Sea. It was a perfectly clear day, not a cloud was to be seen. And from there, you could see the whole central plain from Israel to Jordan, including the northern Dead Sea and Jericho. Ron, as usual, seeking all the divine help possible, said, You know, at the time of the Exodus, God gave the children of Israel a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day so that they would not have to travel and work in the blazing sun. Ron said, I'm going to say a little prayer and ask the Lord to provide us some shade so that we don't have to work in the hot sun. It sounded like a great idea to me. However, there was one big problem. There were no clouds in sight. Now from that point in one's descent from Jerusalem to En Gedi is about 20 miles. And by the time we reached En Gedi, it had clouded up and we found ourselves driving through nothing less than a downpour. Now scripture informs us that many times we have not because we ask not. Ron's little prayer had produced big results. At that point, we had no idea just how big. From En Gedi, it's only about 10 more miles to the site Ron believed to be the location of Gemara, an ashen area at the base of the famous mountain fortress of Masada. After the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, zealots fleeing from the advancing Roman army ascended the tall mountain and took refuge in the stronghold of Herod's Winter Palace. Little did they know that they had set their own trap. It was the policy of the Romans to besiege a city for as long as it took in order to take a city. There, after more than a year, the Jewish zealots met their doom. Knowing the Roman army would soon take the mountain by way of a ramp they had built on the west side, they realized that it would only be a matter of time before they would be captured. In desperation, they took the lives of their own families rather than submit them to the vengeance of the Romans. They then fell on their own swords. <laughs> 